Let's talk about one of the greatest war movies ever made, arguably one of the greatest movies ever made. It's the 1985 Russian World War II movie, Come and See. In my opinion, this is one of the 20 greatest movies ever made. I'm gonna review it for you and analyze it, helping you if you've never seen it or if you have seen it, understand this movie a little bit better. Let's talk about why I think this is one of the greatest movies ever made, coming up next. Come and See is a 1985 Russian movie made by the Russian director Elam Klimov. It's set during, I think, 1941, 1942. Correct me if I'm wrong in the comments. It's about and features a young man in Belarus. The Nazis have invaded Belorussia, as it's called in the movie. They've gone into it as part of the Eastern Front effort to fight Russia, and they've claimed to the Belarusians that they are the liberators of them, liberating them from the Soviet Union. The movie follows this young man as he travels from landscape to landscape, going from group of people to group of people, and he's witness to the devastation, you know, that the Nazis as invaders bring to his homeland. Now the movie's title, Come and See, comes from the Bible, Revelation chapter six. If you read that passage, you see John of Patmos, the revelator, he's in the heavens and he sees or witnesses scrolls unsealed. In the particular passage where the phrase come and see appears, you have him witness to the unsealing of the scrolls and the four horsemen of the apocalypse let loose on the earth. Now I bring up the origin of the title because, you know, people call this a very realistic war movie. And in fact, yes, it is at times. It's also at all times as well, a surrealistic movie for sure. It's also got an allegorical layer to it that I wanna discuss later in the video. And this title come and see as a revelatory title referring to an apocalyptic moment, which means literally a new vision coming about. This boy in this movie is going to get a new vision of what life is about. And you know what? He's gonna wake up to all the horrors of humanity in this movie. call this movie also a Bildungsroman. It's a fancy word, of course, for a coming of age story, a growing up story, where this boy, as he is, 13 to 14 years old, slowly matures into a young man or a man who's world weary by the end of this movie. Now, given that we know that the title refers to the four horsemen of the apocalypse in the Bible, we could force a structure onto the movie. And I think this structure actually works if you want to work with it yourself. The structure is that this movie is in four parts, just as the four scrolls are unsealed in Revelation chapter six. In the first section of the movie, you have the boy torn away from his home by the Belarusian dissidents, the revolutionaries revolting against the Nazi invaders. In fact, in the very first scenes of the movie, he locates a gun, he unburies a gun from the earth, and this is a devastating moment for him. It's a metaphorical scene in which he digs up a weapon and thus begins his career as a freedom fighter, as it were, during World War II, but it's also a moment of total devastation. He's warned, and I think the first line of dialogue in this movie is, don't dig up that gun. Anyway, the first section of this movie shows this boy going from his home as a boy with his mother and his siblings into, you know, the camp of the resistance movement. The second section, I think, starts when the boy meets a young woman and he and she are out in the forest together. I think one way you know that new sections are starting in this movie, I think this is why I broke it into four section, is the boy looks up into the sky. You see against a gray sky, a bomber fly across the sky. I think those are moments when there's a new section starting. So here you've got first the boy taken from his home. In the second section, he's with a young girl. I sort of play a fantasy island scenario in which he and she are out in the woods together for a brief time. Now again, it's realistic, but it's surrealistic. I think every shot in this movie, you could say, comes from the boy's own hallucinatory vision of what's going on. It's a mixture of him seeing things as they are with his five senses, 
but also sort of imputing some kind of meaning onto the scenes we're seeing. And everything we're seeing is either from the boy's perspective or from a third person sort of camera eyewitness perspective. Where the camera in this movie, it's so wonderfully done, is a first person observer. It's like you're the boy's friend going along with him on his journey, as it were. The third section of this movie begins when the boy goes back to the revolutionaries camp and they go on a mission of a sort. And then the fourth section of this movie, and as you can imagine, the movie keeps building and building and becomes more horrible as the movie goes on, shows the boy in a small town where the Nazis are rounding up all the Belarusians and doing something to them. I won't give that away though. Now to me, I see this movie as going through stages of life. In the first stage, the boy is with his family and leaves his mother. Second stage, he's with a young woman. He has a, a little tiny bit of sort of romanticism about this second section. The third section is the boy going with other men, learning to fight, learning to do different things with the revolutionaries. The fourth is a different stage. It's the advanced stage, I think, where the boy is part of a society, but he sees that society ripped apart by the Nazi invaders. And if you want to put the four horsemen of the apocalypse onto this movie, that's what I'm saying, you can put that structure in Revelation 6 in the Bible onto this movie, and then the last section is the writer death, which is where the town is torn apart by the Nazis. Пойдем в мою хату. Скажешь, ты мой внук. Забудь тебя, Митропан. Зразумел? This movie is called, all over the internet, an anti-war movie. I very strongly disagree with that label. I think anti-war generally means pacifist or near pacifist. That is, someone who won't fight in a war or refuses to take part in a war because war is just too devastating. You watch this movie, I think most people are gonna react this way. By the end of it, they're gonna go, I absolutely hate the Nazis. I mean, this movie, you've seen Nazis in movies. You've seen them be goofy villains in, say, Raiders of the Lost Ark or Hellboy or various sort of Hollywood productions. In this movie, you'll absolutely hate them and never want to see them again. And I think this movie is actually an anti-invader movie instead of an anti-war movie. movie wasn't meant to sort of inspire people to fight against the Germans or the Nazis, but you would feel that Belarus needs to be defended, the invaders need to be kicked out. You definitely shouldn't believe the propaganda of liberators or invaders, as it were, who come into a country and go, hey, we're liberating you. This movie is totally against that, calling out their BS. So many scenes in this movie look and feel real, as you might expect with an Eastern Front World War II movie, all kinds of terrible things happen. But as I said, it's surrealistic. I don't believe that almost any shot in this movie necessarily has to be interpreted as real. Every shot in this movie might be the boy's vision, sort of his dream of what could be happening, but it might be skewed by the boy's own perspective. Thus you might say the movie is at once real, every shot in this movie is, and then every shot is also visionary, a product of a boy's imagination. As well, I'm also arguing then you have this allegory of this boy growing up, going from his family home to meet this young girl, to go into war with a bunch of guys, to then have to go into this town and witness society being torn apart. And thus, by the end of the movie, you get this look on the boy's face. This movie uses a lot of extreme or close shots where you see the boy look straight at the camera. Also, other characters look straight at the camera. It gives this movie extra intensity. You have all these shots of the characters look straight at the camera. And at the end of the movie, you see this boy very different from the beginning. He is war-torn, world-weary. It looks like he even has wrinkles on his face. He's aged over the course of this movie, even though it takes place over the span of weeks or a couple months. So as I'm arguing, one of the very rare things about Come and See is at once it gives you a vision of what the Eastern Front, as the Nazis invaded, you know, Ukraine, Belarusia, and the sort of Western part of where Russia is or the Soviet Union was. It gives you a vision of how that might have looked, but it also adds a sort of surrealistic dimension 
and every single shot seems hallucinatory. The woods in this movie are allegorical. They feel like a warped, dark fairy tale land, for example. In the four section movie, there's hallucinatory section again where this boy is lost in a fog in the morning. He's got his cow, he's wandering around. And this fog, you know, represents confusion and delusion, all the things that war bring about. In fact, the metaphor, the fog of war, literally comes up here in the fourth section of this movie. I am not sure there's any more powerful World War II movie than this movie come and see. Go look at the ratings of it all over the place on the internet. You know, sometimes ratings are wrong and sometimes the masses are wrong. In this case, I agree with everybody. I think this movie deserves all the accolades it gets. I think this should be, as I said, in the top 20 movies ever made. It's hallucinatory, it's magical, but in a very dark and disturbing way. And frankly, it's up there to me with the work of Kubrick, the work of Terrence Malick. That's why I think Come and See, one of the best movies ever made. What do you think about this movie? Have you seen it? Oh, by the way, if you're gonna watch this, watch the HD version. There's a brand new, as of 2020, Criterion Collection Blu-ray. It's great looking, put on the biggest screen possible, the loudest speakers possible. That's how people should watch this movie. And I suggest read Revelation chapter six before you watch the movie. I think it will open up your interpretations and your vision of this movie. Please subscribe to my channel for more great movie content. Thank you for watching. Thank you for commenting. Have a great day.